So the next thing we're going to cover here is a little bit about the internals of how factory methods are implemented. And this will also give you a chance to get a better sense of how the completable futures framework is implemented under the hood, and in particular, how its method oriented facade is actually implemented with a message driven implementation approach. So let's take a look, let's zoom in on the supply async method, which is one of those factory methods, which of course arranges to run the supplier lambda within a thread that resides in the common fork join pool. Again, this is the same example we looked at before from my EX8 folder. So we've got a call to supply async and notice that supply async does not create a new thread. Supply async simply queues up the supplier lambda that's passed as a parameter and then that gets processed by a thread that's in the common fork join pool. You'll also notice that it returns a future, a completable future in this case. Sometimes I use the word future just as a shorthand because completable future is a bit of a mouthful to say and a bit of a, um, a fingerful to type. So I'll sometimes say future, but, but always be aware I'm talking about completable futures at this point. And so it returns a completable future that's completed by a worker thread running in the common fork join pool in this particular approach. The parameter that's passed here to supply a sync is, as before, the supplier lambda that multiplies two big fractions together. And once again, we're using effectively final variables. And what happens here is that when we make this call, those values are captured, that's the fancy name for it, and they will be used later when the actual computations occurs in a different thread of control but those values will not change because they are effectively final. You can read more about effectively final in the link at the bottom of the page. So what'll happen is that this supplier lambda is actually gonna get passed down as a message throughout the implementation of the completable futures framework. And eventually this supplier lambda will be called by using its get method, because that's what suppliers provide. The get method will be called, but it won't be called in the calling thread it'll be called in the context of some worker thread. And that will call the supplier get method, which will get this computation, which has been packaged up in a Lambda. And then it'll go ahead and perform that computation in the context of the worker thread. And that's the genius and the beauty of functional programming and its combination of with asynchronous computations through a message driven message passing architecture. So here's how things kind of work under the hood. So if you were to go and peek down into the implementations of the completable futures Java file, you would see a couple things. First, you would see this code for the implementation of supply sync. And second, you're, if you really poke around here for a while, your, your brain is likely to melt and your mind will explode because it's really complicated code and there's almost no comments. I don't know why that's the case, uh, but at any rate, it's, it's not for, um, uh, it, it's, it's rather daunting and it's not for people who just want to have a very superficial knowledge of what's going on to make any sense of. So I will help to decipher some of it for you as it matters for the purposes of our discussion. So what happens is in this case, the supplier, which is that Lambda expression that we showed back here, that gets passed in as a supplier parameter to supply async. And you can see that that parameter is then going to be used internally and bundled up inside of a new instance of a helper class that's internal to the completable futures framework called async supply. So you can see how we're going to take that supplier parameter, which had all that multiplication stuff in it, and that supplier lambda is then bound to the supplier parameter that's received by the supply async method. And what'll happen there is that that's then encapsulated in an async supply message. So we make a new instance of async supply, which we will look at in a second. And that's a class that's now a message passing based approach. So the supplier goes into that async supply uh, object, which we'll look at in a second. And then we take the async supply object and we go ahead and enqueue it for subsequent asynchronous execution in the common fork join pool. So we call this exec async method passing it in the message that encapsulates the supplier lambda, passing it in a reference, in this case, to the, the common pool from the fork join pool framework, uh, 
And that's a good example of message passing. So this is exactly what the reactive programming paradigm is talking about when they say that reactive programs should be message driven. Well, that's what we're doing. We're making a message and then queuing it up for later execution in, in a different context. Here is that different context or part of that different context. This is the async supply class, which is a nested class nested inside of the completable futures framework. And this is going to ultimately execute the supplier Lambda parameter inside of a thread that resides within the common fork join pool. So you can see that async supplier is a static final class, which just means that it's only going to have a meaning in the context of the, the, the uh, completable futures framework and you can't extend it and so on. It, it's just meant to do its thing. It extends the async class. And if you poke around a bit within the completable future implementation, you will see that async extends the fork join task. So fork join task, of course, is that class that comes as part of the fork join framework. And it also is going to extend or rather implement the uh, runnable interface. So it's going to, it's going to extend fork join task and implement runnable so it can be executed in a thread pool. That's, that's what an async does. And if we take a look down here, you can see that the constructor for async supply takes the supplier parameter and squirrels it away inside of a local field. So it's a, or rather a, a final field that's, that's inside of an instance of apply, or sorry, uh, async supply. So this is basically stashing away that supplier for subsequent processing in a background thread. And that subsequent processing takes place in a method here called exec, which is a final method, which means it, it can't be overridden. And you can see what it does. This exec method is going to be run, or going to be called back by a thread in the common fork join pool. And when it's called back, it's going to say, hey, supplier parameter, which is going to hold that function, please go ahead and do your thing. So fn.get is a directive by the functional programming features in Java to go ahead and execute that supplier lambda passed originally to supply async. And you can see here that what that does, of course, is multiply the two big fractions together and return a result. So that's going to run asynchronously in the background by a worker thread in the common fork join pool. And it's going to do the computation and it's going to store the result into a, a local variable called u. And eventually that'll get propagated back as the result of this particular computation. Now, this get method that we're calling here could use the fork join pool manage blocker capability that we talked about before when we were discussing ways to be able to add new threads to the common fork join pool in order to be able to auto scale the pool size for operations that would block. Now, in this particular case, we're just multiplying two big fractions together. So there's really no need to go to the trouble of using the managed blocker capability. However, be aware that if we were going to do operations that would block, like IO operations or ones that required access to, to blocking synchronizers like a semaphore or a condition variable and so on, in that particular case, then you could use the managed blocker mechanism to have the fork join pool, the common fork join pool, auto scale and add a new thread so it wouldn't end up degrading the concurrency by blocking. We don't need that in this case, but it's, it's a nice hook that you can use if you need it. So just be aware that that could be used. So that's the end of the overview of the internals or a portion of the internals of the Completable Futures framework, focusing in this particular case on the use of the supply sync factory method and how it's implemented using message passing to take a supplier Lambda that's passed into supply async and then wrap it up inside an async supply message object, which then gets queued up and is run to completion later by a worker thread in the common fork join pool. So hopefully that kind of helps to connect some of the earlier discussions about reactive programming and some of the key principles of reactive programming with what we're seeing here as the implementation of the completable futures framework, or at least a portion of it.